the Wheelie Podcast. Let your iPod bloom. Welcome to Podcast 88. I'm sat on the Wiggly sofa in rural Herefordshire. My name's Heather Gorringe and I am MD of Wiggly Wigglers. I'm joined today by... Richard from Wiggly Wigglers also. Uh, silence. And, and Noah, <laughs> who's just licking her crutch. Uh, right, do I write? <laughs> Except he's a him. And Noah's a cat. Uh, absolutely. Oh yes, yeah. that's a very, <laughs> very good point, Richard. Uh, Noah, dear listener, is indeed... A cat. And also joining me here on the Wiggly Sofa is... Farmer Phil. Who runs the farm, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> on today's show, we're going to find out all about Open Farm Sunday and how that went in Herefordshire and on our own farm. And we're going to hear from Matthew Naylor, who is our new flower supplier from Lincolnshire. So, let's get on with the show. Do, 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 do. But first of all, Richard, you've been hobnobbing again. And I don't mean eating chocolate hobnobs. No, probably do that as well. Have you? Yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, you know, I, just, I did go down to London oh, a couple of weeks ago for a do bit of a marketing do really I think but there was a chance of networking you know that people like to say but anyway just a, chance a minute to you went to a marketing networking do yeah was yeah. there anything connected Free lunch. with you <laughs> and oddly it was just by you know we went down to BTCV um, a few months ago business in, fact, in the it, community actually, it was longer it was last summer wasn't it now yeah literally the, the pub that I went to was just around the corner from there so oh. I, can, I had a nice little walk down got off at Angel you know and walked down that canal so it was a lovely beautiful but a, day. a networking yeah, it was what, ne- what to do with it? It was all about sustainable living. Really. Ah. So there were various companies there. I'd got visions that, of uh, you at the local chamber meet- meeting, shaking <laughs> yeah. hands with the suits. No. Not quite no, then. No, well, I, I'll try and avoid those if I can. Mm, best thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, but I went down and uh, there were a couple of people there that, that I wanted to talk to. There's a guy there. Chris Hines, who I, I mentioned, I think, when I mean, Rachel and I were rattling um, the last time, he was talking about how our behaviour affects uh, the things that go on around us. So that was really great. And Jenny Lee Grace was there as well from, uh, you know, she sits in with Steve Wright in the afternoon on Radio 2. So I had a rattle with her because I've met her before. She's not as good as Ask Elvis, though. She's not as good as Ask no Elvis. No way. She's quite different from, <laughs> from Ask Elvis. <laughs> Did you, you know that you can, get, you can download Ask Elvis as a podcast? Yes. So that I, yeah, have, right. I have Ask Elvis downloaded automatically on my computer. Right. Essential right. listening. Anyway, she's second to <laughs> so, Ask Elvis. So yeah, well anyway, she, yeah, but uh, Janie, Janie had a rattle about how she, how she lives really, holistic lifestyles, etc. So it's quite interesting, so it makes a nice little feature really for, for this podcast. Right, let's hear it. Just gonna, just gonna have to, I all I wanted to say was it's nice to see you. I've, I've, um, Jenny, I've met you before, haven't I? You have, yeah. We met at the Chelsea Flower Show when I um, came and said hello and told you that you were promoted in my book and you seemed hugely unimpressed. <laughs> but you are. I'm completely doged by the, by the fact that we were at Chelsea. <laughs> I think. But yeah, no, it's, it's lovely to see you. You've got the most amazing green eyes, by the way. Oh, contact lenses. Yeah, is that what it is? God's yeah. light, they show up in that sort. What's interesting is when I met you on the Chelsea stand, it wasn't last, it wasn't last year, was it? I think it might have been the year before. Actually, yeah. And uh, my colleague, who, who tends to spend most of the time listening to local radio stations, either live in or BBC Herald and Western or something, uh, and I said, oh, I know who that was. That was uh, Jenny Lee Grace. She said, who's that? I said, oh, she's on with Steve Wright in the afternoon. She said... Is he still going? Oh, 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 <laughs> she kind of remembered him from you know, Radio he 1. Just one out, back out of the loop, love. Yeah, Radio yeah. 2 is the most oh, listened to station well, in the it UK. Is, <laughs> <back entirely. laughs> it is, it is. It is. But, but what, was, uh, what I often do when I listen to Steve Wright in the afternoon, because you always come across as the, you know, as the, as the ambassador for all things environmentally oriented. You know, you, you know, and they, they kind of they don't take the mick. Oh, completely. I think you're fine, they do. But they, right. <laughs> no, no, I mean, with the green issues, they're a little more friendly. But my thing is, is 
is, is not just the green issues. My thing is, um, my, my brand, if you like, is imperfectly natural. And so what I'm looking at is the holistic approach. Right. Uh, and it really is everything. So it's your own health and well-being as well as the planet. I mean, it never ceases to amaze me that there are men, there's many an eco-warrior who, who you know, really cares a lot about the planet. And that's fabulous. But then they don't look to consider what they stick under their own armpits um, or whatever. And, uh, and I really think you have to look at the holistic picture. So why, why don't we do that, though? Why don't we? It's like Chris Hines, uh, you're, you're from Eden Project, you're a sustainability director, director yeah. at Eden. We've never met before, but it was interesting what you were saying earlier on. You were talking about the fact that we could often buy a cotton T-shirt if we're going to, say, Primark or something like that. Not specifically targeted Primark, but they're a, they're a good example. Buy a cotton T-shirt for a couple of quid. But that cotton T-shirt may well have occurred as a consequence of you know, a big compromise on many, many communities, which, which could come back on us. Sure. The, what, what I was saying was that you know, we desire all these throwaway products, and we're, we're in there buying some fashion things that we may wear that T-shirt once, or twice and we want them for nothing and the supermarkets and other chain stores keep pushing them at us for nothing but actually in the Indus Valley and in Pakistan loads of the farmland has actually become unusable because it's become so saline and so poor in its quality because of over farming to grow the cotton for us that actually people have had to leave that land 40% of the people now living in Karachi live in slums. Most of them have come from abandoned farms, and that is the biggest recruiting ground for Al-Qaeda and global terrorism. So our cheap T-shirts are linked to global terrorism. See, a lot of people wouldn't get it, would they? So how do you, I mean, as a broadcaster, I guess you're in, in a, a fairly unique position that you're able to be able to get those kind of messages across to millions of listeners? Um, not, not really, not in terms of being a broadcaster. I just chip in to what is effectively an entertainment show. Every now and then when we talk about lifestyle issues I'll put my two penneth worth in but the way I'm trying to get my if you like message to the mainstream is through the books that I write and through my own website and my approach is, is very much aimed at the mainstream I mean what about that particular issue you're just talking about what I say is the average person you know particularly if you've got kids often the first time you think about environmental stuff is when you have your first baby you know your average person on the street will consider the food that they give to their baby even if they've never considered their own food and so they'll start looking you know to organic food or whatever or things that are non gm and yet they forget that the, the T-shirt they're wearing probably contains, you know, um, genetically modified stuff. And it's those kind of things that you just start to, start to think, oh, hold on, there's, there's more to this. And then when you start to look at the whole holistic picture and the fair trade and the ethical issues as well, then, as Chris says, it all starts to make it's quite sense. Fun. It's quite fun as well, though, isn't it? I think sometimes people think, oh, I can't be bothered with all that. You know, why should I be bothered with all that? Surely that's going to overcomplicate my life and my lifestyle. But for you, and for, and for, and actually for me, it's, it's really good fun to be able to sort of consider everything that you eat and that you wear and all those kind of things well I think, I think the, what I'm trying to do because I've, I've, I've called my thing imperfectly natural and the imperfect is the really important bit because I don't, you can't get everything right you'll just work yourself into an early grave if you try and get everything right just do the bits you can and don't worry about the bits you can't but obviously what tends to happen is that as you find more and more great alternatives you know eventually you, you, end up, you do end up doing everything because you realise there is a more natural fairer traded alternative to just about everything everything now and often you know there it'll cost you less money and it will certainly be better for your health and well-being and be better for the planet in the process so I, I kind of pride myself on having loads of great funky tips for for products and services and ideas that are a, a brilliant alternative and if you can fast track people to those then it, it takes the stress out of it superb have wise words so you've got a website I have it's imperfectlynatural.com okay. and the book that Wiggly Wigglers is mentioned in is uh, Imperfectly Natural Woman that and sell. again that, we should that you should sell, sell. and yeah. again in Imperfectly Natural Baby and Toddler which is just out now on Orion Books OK well, what I might do I've asked your fella here to uh, to email me because I'm going to send him a load of Jen about podcasting and whatnot. Um, so uh, so what you could what you could do is uh, send me a couple of samples of your book so I can read it read through. You know what? You can go straight down to Waterstones and buy one, <laughs> particularly as you're yeah, as you're, like particularly yeah, as you know, are actually you know promoted in there. Yeah, <laughs> well, you know when you th look at how many sales I might have brought you, love. Yeah, you can good. afford the yeah. twelve quid. Trust yeah. me. <laughs> You'll be asking me for a free surfboard in a minute, won't he? Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's excellent. Thank you very much, Janie. No problem. Well, thanks very much, Chris. And have you seen pleasure. those fishing rods that are made of carrots? No. That's a new product. I've got yes, I've heard. I've heard about yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, so I'm going to go buy one because I okay. need a new fly rod. I'm going to see what they're like. <laughs> right. Good. Thank pleasure. you both. Cheers. All right. Bye. I'm going hobnobbing this week.
with chocolate hobnobs. You are always going hobnobbing. <laughs> yes. You are a hobnob. Oh, yes. Actually, I've got two hobnobbing <coughs> moments. I'm going to be part of the radio festival where all the people in radio get together, whether it's the producer or the presenter or, you know, the person in charge of BBC Radio, and we're part of a case study. And I love the seminar title because our seminar title is called Look Who's Behind You. And it's all about podcasting. And so next Thursday, we get to be part of a seminar run by Rory Kathleen Jones, who's the technical correspondent for the BBC. And Wiggly Wigglers is featured. And yesterday, they came and did a load of filming. So yes. there's my hobnobbing. And your hobnobbing, Farmer Phil? Well. <laughs> We've got a, a meeting with, with our landlord on Thursday, I believe. Yeah. So that'll be another yeah, free right. lunch, rude yeah. not to. Yeah. I have got to say, actually, though, that in Heather's hobnobbing, I know who's going to be behind Heather, and it's going to be Anna telling him <laughs> her that she can't have <laughs> any <laughs> chocolate hobnobs. I think in the interest of uh, getting Prince Charles here to come down and do a, do a little f- feature for us with a podcast, get him on the wiggly sofa, I think it's, it's Prince Charles that should be behind Heather on Thursday. <laughs> For those listeners who don't know, because obviously these two are getting awfully clicky and assuming that you know everything about us, our landlord is the Duchy. And so um, on Thursday we get to go and have a, well, they call it a reception, don't they? With uh, It's a how many Duke. canapes you can eat in an hour and a half competition. Yes. All right. Last time we managed 15 and we were still hungry. But it's with the Duke and Duchess right. of Cornwall. So Prince Charles and Camilla. Camilla. Mm. So there we are. There, so that's it. There we are, listener. Aren't we clever? <laughs> oh, for God's sake. Here we go. We'll go back down to earth with our latest iTunes review. Hmm. It's a five star, but I'm not sure what to make of it. It says the only podcast you will ever need five stars, and it's by The Fulling. It says this has to be the best podcast of all time, both entertaining and informative going well yeah heather's enthusiasm and bubbly personality still going well but in brackets it says she has to be a purebred halfling (laughs) now we're farming (laughs) makes for riveting listening well luckily i don't know what one is but i anyway moving on Uh, wiggly wigglers has inspired me to change my whole lifestyle and convert my overgrown wilderness, it's a wildlife garden, honest, of a garden, into a thriving vegetable allotment complete with composting, water saving, and soon, I hope, a can of worms. Thank you, Wiggly Wigglers. So I don't know what a halfling is, so I don't know if you two could shed a little light on that. Well, we think <laughs> that the term halfling refers to J.R.R. Tolkien's hobbits who inhabit Middle Earth. And the point about hobbits are that they have several habits, but they're short for a start. (laughs) They've got Um, hairy feet. Oh, yes, they've got hairy feet. (laughs) They also like drinking beer, and they have at least seven meals a day. Mm -hmm. They're very affable, friendly sort of people, spirited. But, they are you know, huge comparisons, I do say. <laughs> Salt of the earth types. Yeah. Yes. It's and so we, we found quite a lot of similarities, really. Yeah. Do they yeah. have a lot of bad hair days? I would oh. say they do. They do. Right. They do. OK, well, <laughs> obviously there's some um, more information to be gleaned from this, but thank you very much. The fulling. We decided. So does that mean that, that he's very tall then? I the think fulling. So, well, yeah. I think we decided that the fulling knows you better than perhaps you think he does, hmm. or she. I did have a particularly bad hair day on the Wiggly video cast, so perhaps that's it. Moving on. Okay, so Farm Sunday. What well, did what you a think? day we had! It was a brilliant day, wasn't it? Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, superb. All the Farm Sundays going on all over the country, but we had a great day. It was good times had by all. I think. Thing is, I missed you in the hole. We mm. did dig a hole. Uh, well, Billy dug a hole for Richard to stand in, which yeah. I think was excellent, the it highlight was. of the day. Especially um, there were steps getting in and out. I was, was I, was, I was relieved to see that. Um, but I missed that, and we've had several people saying the highlight of their day was Richard in the hole. And bearing in mind you weren't filled in in the hole, can you just give me briefly what oh, you spoke what about? Doing? Well, I was just looking at well, various things, really. The idea was to look at the soil, the soil structure and to get a, get a feel of the geology of, of Herefordshire and specifically the Herefordshire Plain and then look at the crops that grow on the soil. In this instance, we were looking at barley, weren't we? Mm. 
So that was great. And then, of course, looking at worms and the part they play, the vital part they play in, uh, in you know, in improving soil health. So how soil deep was the topsoil and what could you see? Well, we saw that, interestingly, the profiles here aren't quite as distinct as they are in some areas. There are only five different rock types in uh, geological types in Herefordshire. The predominance is sandstone, old red sandstone. I've got 95% of Herefordshire is old red sandstone. That's why we have our sort of characteristic red soil. And it can go down to something like 2,000 metres, I think, in places. But here, so you have, you, you know, you have your sandstone, which probably starts several metres down under the ground, and, you, and then you're going to have your clay and your red marl, and then your soil. But it, when you dig out a bucket full of soil there, it looks completely impermeable. It's really strange. Billy was saying how, what a great place it would be for a pond. But the drainage is remarkably good, isn't it, mm. on that, you, on that where, where your hole was, you're standing on about 20 feet of silt. Right. And underneath that, you get into gravel. Right. And obviously the reason for that is it's all alluvial stroke mm. glacial. As you go further up the hill, where the sandstone comes to the surface, you get the marls that you were talking about. And certainly round the end of the hill, there's quite a thick vein of blue marl which is the most evil stuff. It's as hard as nails until it gets wet and then it goes like porridge. It's very strange stuff yeah. indeed. But uh, you were right, the topsoil and the subsoil, there isn't a great deal of difference where you were, but it, structurally you could see the difference. Yeah, the... you could see the structure. I mean, obviously the, the topsoil is crumbly and, and it, it's kind of altogether gentler, I guess, if you, if, you, if you want to describe it like that. But it's interesting in this area because there is a little glacial cirque I guess, a little kettle hole really isn't it, just outside the house here, that's a natural feature, natural pond and uh, I mean the ice age would have receded something like 10,000 years ago and the last ice age getting to, to Hereford I think the last glacial sheet was got to about Hereford prior to that would have been much further down and much further south um, so but you have got various uh, moraine deposits as well in this valley so literally if you go to Breadline three or four miles up the road there, you can see some of that high ground there and those the various um, alluvial deposits there moraine moraine is what uh, you know when a glacier pushes forward it scuffs up lots and lots of different sediment mm. rock pieces and whatnot and and when it recedes and stops some of those rock pieces are, are deposited um, i mean there are various different types of moraines but left is that the one. scar <clears throat> of Bredodine? No, I think that's a that's a glacial stroke because that's sandstone you're looking at. Yeah. Isn't where it? is it? Where is the scar? The, the scar is a, is a, is in a bend of the river, oh, okay. but it's a, effectively a cliff face into the river, isn't right. it? Yeah. Right. And I think it's just where a combination of river and ice. But don't you know where the scar is? Uh, I don't. Yeah. I'm, see, I'm everyone sure. is having love round here knows yeah, where the scar yeah, is because that's the lane that you I'm, go up for I'm love. in must <laughs> love around these parts. <laughs> It's not my stomping ground, really, was it? Um, it, it is now, oddly. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take Rach down the scar. Oh, Lord. The, uh, <laughs> yeah, so it was interesting, really. I mean, it, 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 was, it was nice for people to be able to appreciate the types of soil, how it got there. I mean, the sandstone was laid down in the Devonian period. It was about 345 million years ago. Where I live, uh, on the Woolhope Dome, a lot of those limestone deposits there were put down under the Silurian Seas, about... 460 million years or something like that. But, I mean, some of the oldest rocks that people will know about in Herefordshire are the Mulvans. And, of course, they are Oldest rock you know, in the whole... Precambrian. I think they date back anything... I think Precambrian can date back to 4,500 million years ago. So, uh, so they're, they're... But I think I don't think they're quite that old, the Mulvans. I think they're something like 750 million oh, years. Oh, shut like up. That. Right. But it's it's interesting stuff, isn't it? I mean, because you don't know it, you need to take all these things for granted. So it's, yeah, it's but interesting all these to see, numbers. see how they got there and how they, how they were formed, how they were made in the first place. So anyway, we looked at the soil and then we, um, we, we looked at <laughs> barley. How deep were the great. barley roots, I wondered? If they get a free rain, about 12 feet. Is that right? <gasps> mm. Blimey. Really? Yeah. And is that why they're such a successful plant then? Because they don't need such high quality... It does vary according to how wet or not the winter is. If, if they have a wet winter, they don't push their roots down as deep. But it is thought that the little tiny microscopic roots of, of cereals will go down that far. That's a long way down. Fair play. That's just getting down to sort of comfrey depth, really, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. That's but, of course, that, that demonstrates the fact that it's, you know, we spend quite a lot of time looking after the structure of our topsoil and perhaps the first few inches of our subsoil. But what goes on below that is also of importance because if you constrain the roots of any plant, 
particularly when you run out of water and we're quite dry now, yeah. that's where your problems start. Um, and you know, no water, it doesn't matter whether you're using chemicals or not, or fertilizer or not, water and sunshine are two critical inputs, however you want to grow your plants, garden or anything else for that matter. And so what were people interested in about the barley? Presumably just the beer tasting. The beer tasting, but also what that was, I mean, that was an inspired idea of yours to, uh, to stop and get some real ale on the, on the way through Yarrowfit mm. on Sunday. I noticed and, uh, that at the end of the day. Oh, great. I it's noticed nice, how nice. Rich tottered towards the cake yeah. stall <laughs> later on in the <laughs> afternoon with an inane grin on his yeah. face. It's really great, it's a lovely beer. I think people were surprised about how many applications barley has. Because if you look at a field like that, and one, one thing that I was really keen to impress upon people is how simple it is to take a few grains of barley. If you've got a, a place in your garden that you don't know what to do with, then why not just throw a few grains of barley there, off it goes. And suddenly you've got this wonderful crop that can support all sorts of invertebrate life, but mammalian life as well, because it's a cereal. You know, voles and mice will be in amongst it. It's just a job, and you get owls off the back of that. Duck, everybody. That was seriously for a low jet. <laughs> Biggles is just uh, yeah. late, late for his breakfast, so I think. Sorry about that, listener. It's just a... and, but also the fact that you know, barley straw is a, is a great suppressor of a blanket weed, filamentous algae in a pond. You can, you can use it for flower arranging, but it also reflects light beautifully. It moves wonderfully in the wind, so it makes it it's, aesthetically it's, it's fantastic. And of course, fundamentally, it's, it's used, barley mole is used for, to make beautiful tasting beers. And then it's a, you know it's a crop that's used for animal fodder, so it's multifaceted plant again. Something that's dead easy. And we've mentioned this before. How it, how it, it appears that many of the plants that are easiest to grow are, the, are, the, are, the, are superb in many respects. Yeah, we had 91 people on the farm altogether, and 1,800 folk visited Herefordshire Farms. The record number was at Marston Court Farm, where Roger and Jill Williams had just under 400 people joining in all sorts of activities. They had weaving spinning, butter making and they had a hog roast. Now Michael will now give me the figures. So the average number of people that visited each farm was? 75. 75. But if you take out the 400 it was? 68. 68. So we were above average on all counts. Mm. Well done team. And thank you to every single person who helped us. I won't run through them but they know who they are. We had many farmers come and help us with parking and talks. We had the Dutchie agent. We had Michael taking photos. But the highlight of the day had to be at ten past two when Farmer Phil rushed in the yard and said... We've got a cow calving. That was amazing, wasn't it? Amazing timing. I can't say that Farmer Phil was terribly enthusiastic about it at the time because... It's the sort of thing which is fraught with danger. Yeah. And that, you know, when you've got particularly children, but also adults who've never seen that sort of thing before, there is the chance that it could all go wrong. Mm. And, well, as you found, it, it's quite, it makes quite an impression on you, doesn't it, yeah, when you see it yeah. for the first time. That's an amazing But thankfully, watch. it was an absolute copybook carving. And just to see the expression on some of the children... Stood it. We, we were in one of the bullpens, which was handy because the, the rails are all see through, so the kids could get quite close. Yeah. And the, just the expression on their face. And they were still chattering about it two hours later. Uh, and, I, yeah. you know, that's something they'll never forget. No. Was there oohs and ahs or yucks and yuckies? A little bit, but it was as I was doing it, I was trying to explain a bit like I did with Rich what I was doing and what was happening and why I was doing it. And so that they were. It wasn't totally unexpected. I tried to preempt a little bit of what was going to happen and what it might look like and so on. So that there were a few, and, I mean, obviously the kids were enthralled and one or two of the women were wincing at various stages where, where, you know, with the carving aid and so on for obvious reasons. But it was a, a copybook carving and everything was absolutely fine. So we were chuffed to bits with that, and that was an opportunity that really had to be taken but you couldn't legislate for it, but it was great that it went well. There was a typical Farmer Phil episode, though. You know, planning Farm Sunday, <laughs> as you know, I do like everything to be you just are, so. Yeah, and I by the way, one, Richard, I did in, specifically in, in ask you not to come a half one. And at 25 past one, I did ask where you were, and you weren't in attendance. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I do I like things that. to do just OK. And the particular thing that I requested at least four months ago was 
that Farmer Phil was not collecting the newly adapted trailer on Friday night or Saturday morning. Right. Because it's very important that we tried and tested it. Health and safety is the most important thing. And I didn't want him rushing around at the last minute. The good thing was that I didn't collect it on Friday night, nor did I collect it on Saturday morning. Nor on Saturday night. I had a message at (laughs) half past seven on Sunday morning (laughs) from my good friend and colleague Keith that he had completed the trailer and it was ready for collection. However, there was a slight compromise because he said because it was a bit late, we haven't had time to paint it. And so I have to apologise to all those with light-coloured <laughs> oh. blouses and whatever else who got home to find a certain amount of... Um, rust. Well, no. oil. No. Oil and no. rust. No, I saw, right, <laughs> ladies yeah. in pure linen, yeah. right, who were sat there enjoying the trailer ride, and when they turned round, there was, across their back, a black strip. Nice. In a row. Nice. And I couldn't tell them. I just couldn't no, say anything. That's, that's not but there that's also were several that's children that's who unfortunately found out they'd got hay fever. But right. they'd been holding on to the trailer with their hands. Oh, gosh. And so then when their eyes ran, they rubbed them in their eyes. And there was all these people. I kept thinking, are we doing face painting or something? <laughs> Have they come as camouflage? And and it wasn't that. I they wonder were, why they were Yeah, did you see them? Mucky faces. All the way. Oh, I wonder what they would up to then. Yeah. yeah, and they were covered in oil. Yeah, it's all part really of it. the experience. I think oh, it's yeah. important for children on farms to get good and dirty. That's all. Get part. covered it's, in... But I don't think it's funny. <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, I did help. the risk assessments and everything. Who would come up with that? I mean... <sighs> yeah, but it, didn't it go well? <laughs> It did go well, but isn't that annoying? Yeah. And you wait, I bet you there will be 45 ladies in linen that sue Farmer Phil's butt off. <laughs> so I think Farmer Phil wouldn't mind that at all. OK, next wiggly news is that we've appointed our new florist. Uh, we haven't lost Anne. She's going to continue to do bouquets, but the thing is, we've got so many to do, she can't cope. Right. So we've appointed our new florist, so welcome to Karen James, who's coming along on the 24th, but we've been sourcing our flowers from farmers directly. And one of the farmers that we're sourcing from is called Matthew Naylor, who turns out to be slightly famous in the farming world, I'd say. He is a writer for Farmers Weekly. He's a Nuffield Scholar. He's won the Nuffield Scholar Presentation Award last year, and he's got his own blog called... It's a very snappy title, www.fwi.co.uk forward slash blogs forward slash Lincolnshire dash farming dash blog. Anyway, um, he's got a great blog and one of the posts says 2012 Olympic logo. Anybody seen it? I've yeah. seen oh, the new one. Yeah. yeah. He says, can I just say how mm-hmm. very horrible the new logo is for the 2012 Olympics? This is an awful piece of branding. Was it designed by a farmer, by any chance? (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, um, here we go. uh, Interview with Matthew Naylor, who is now supplying our first box this week of homegrown Lincolnshire delphiniums and peonies. Right, I'm sat here. Outside the Royal Agricultural College. In the prestigious. quadrant, do they call this? The yeah. quadrant or the quadrangle? Oh, it must be. With Matthew Naylor, who is a fellow Nuffield scholar. I'm allowed to say that now. So thank you, Matthew, for coming on the Wiggly podcast. Please tell me a little bit about you and your scholarship and how that's changed your farming. Well, I've never really thought like normal farmers anyway, so I, I sort of had to go on this Nuffield to see whether I could turn myself into a proper farmer, and it hasn't really worked. Um, we grow flowers in Lincolnshire, uh, which normally just smells of cabbages and rotting cauliflowers. So, I thought there was some whiff about oh, you. Oh, there is, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and we decided to go into flowers and, you know, become like a little bowl of potpourri in the middle of, of all this stench, and that's worked quite well for us. It's, yeah, it's, it's quite a bit of fun. So what do you grow? Well, and why did you choose whatever it is? Well, we've always grown... My grandfather started growing daffodils about 60 years ago, and we're still doing that. 
and I, I love doing it. I love selling daffodils. So I was looking for something that I could grow at other times of the year. And we came up with delphiniums and peonies because at the time, the imported stuff just wasn't very good. It, it, they don't travel very well. So we knew that we could do it better. And tell me the story about your very tall delphiniums. Well, I didn't go to university. That's why I'm sitting here at the Siren Sister with a chip on my shoulder. <laughs> Pretend the government undergraduate. They're awfully posh. Aren't they? <laughs> no, it's very posh. Yes. Everyone we can see has got bright yellow corduroys yeah, on and check shirts and rugby shirts with cravats. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I didn't do all this, so um, I, I have to learn by mistakes. That's that's the only way that I can do it. And the first time I grew these delphiniums, I put them all quite close together, and oh, I must use plenty of fertilizer. This was the 1990s when we all used lots of fertilizer, and. Um, and they ended up about seven feet tall. Now, <laughs> as you can see, I'm a giant. I'm a very, very tall man anyway. Mm, yes, a uh, lot taller than me. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't a problem for me. But, yeah, that was quite an interesting one. We didn't, uh, yeah, we, we didn't find them very easy to transport uh, or to find customers for. Did you have a box that was seven foot tall then? No, we ended up pulling flowers. I was ridiculous. It was like going up the beanstalk, living with the giant. It was <laughs> stupid. Uh, but I have learned how to do my job since then. <laughs> how tall are your delphiniums now? We sell them at about a metre long and then the ones that go to Waitrose get trimmed when they get to the processor and constantly keep having a little bit taken off the bottom just to keep them uh, drinking well. Uh, so there's a little bit of room there. And so are they all grown in a polytunnel? No, we don't have any polytunnels because, well, it's, it's near to the farm and it would just be a bit of a, a, an eyesore. So just we, we just minute. go natural season. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's two o'clock. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry, late. yeah, so you're going them outside. Yeah, just natural season. We're just trying things like uh, cutting the tops off early, um, just when they're about to start coming through the ground, to try and delay some that way so that they flower for a bit longer. And how many acres have you got? We have about 32 acres of delphiniums. And where do they go to? You know, who buys them? All over. Um, florists in London, well, throughout the country, and then Waitrose, Marks & Spencer... A few to Sainsbury, a few to Tesco last year. So any retailer who we think is going to look after them properly in store and, and get them to the customer, right? What do we need to do once we've got them to make sure they do get to the customer OK? I mean, that's down to the supermarkets, making sure that they're transported as quickly as possible. We cut them and deliver them the same day. Yeah. And so hopefully they can uh, do the same to get them nice and fresh. And I think once you get them at home, then it's important to just keep change you trim the bottoms and keep changing that water regularly to keep them alive as long as possible and so when can wiggly customers get hold of some of these matthew well i've had to go away from the that's why i'm here i just was getting so impatient about these things waiting for them to flower i think that they'll be flowering the first week of june and so we'll uh, we'll have flowers on the go then right through the summer we always say that they start in time for chelsea flower show uh, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's going to be exciting and busy then. And how many stems will you end up producing? Oh, a good question. Uh, hundreds of thousands. Hundreds of thousands. But not millions. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Said, said Matthew to the tax man. <laughs> or tens of thousands, tens of thousands. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. For those of you who've missed Monty's Wormcasts, he's going to record a whole new set very shortly. He's just doing his exam, so good luck today, Monty, with English. Mm. And we found a cat on the road, didn't we? We did, yes. Prognosis is a bit doubtful at the moment. The cat mm. has got a serious headache and doesn't seem to be able to see much. But anyway, he's in Ailes's tender care at the vets at the moment. She's going to x-ray her and sort of try and find out whether the wiring is terminally wrong or not. I if found it... it in the bottom of the hedgerow on the road. I think it might have been dumped. And you were cycling? No, I was running oh, yesterday right. morning. All oh, right. Yep, I'm back on running. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, I thought, you know, maybe we should just keep it. So I came up with a name for it because um, Noah is Noah the cat, as you know. Yeah. So I thought that I, if I named it, it would mean that we could keep it. So I thought I would find out what Noah's wife was called. But sadly, she had no name, so they called her Namer, which I don't think is really very snappy, no, do you? No, no, She's no. referred to five times in the Bible as the wife of Noah. Right. So maybe that's the title. Anyway, 
uh, we've got to go for this week. We've got lots more coming up. I know that Richard's off to see Trevor Walton. And I know that he's shaking his watch and that's the noise that you just heard. Sorry, that's all my <laughs> thing. Oh, I should have taken it off. Do a little I? shake so listeners know. <laughs> that is my watch. That is. And I know that Phil is going to let you know more about our pigs. Yep, now we've finished week. Open Farm Sunday, we're going to chase up the pigs. So it's bye from us. Hope you enjoyed the show. If you get a chance, give us a review on iTunes. And if you don't, oh, we'd really like a review in Australia, New Zealand, Japan. Uh, we'd like a review in uh, Hawaii. Herefordshire. In, yeah. yeah, Herefordshire <laughs> might be quite nice. Bye for now. Bye, bye from me. asked Michael what a halfling was and he said this I've lost it <laughs> it's, also, it's also fluid isn't it <laughs> oh dear it's almost better that she hasn't read any of the books yeah is it yeah <laughs>